Hello, everybody. Again, it's great to see you all here. Thank you so much for coming. Hopefully you can all hear me OK and you can see a big red slide on your screen with the title of the webinar. Would you mind just writing yes or hello? Yes, fine. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, everybody. Fantastic. Great, great. So let's look at what we'll be looking at over the next 45, 50 minutes or so. So firstly, I have to say again, thank you very much for coming because I know a teacher's day is a super busy one. So thank you for sharing your time and coming along. Um, with that in mind, the slides are available to you after the session. So you don't need to make notes. If you want to, that, that's great, please do. But there's absolutely no need. Um, also, as Will mentioned, it's going to be an interactive webinar, so I'm going to ask you some questions as we go through, and if you want to use the chat box, just as you're all brilliantly doing now, that would be fantastic. If you don't fancy the chat box today and you just want to watch and listen, that's also fine. Do whatever works for you. So let's look at the three sections of the webinar today. First of all, we're going to identify and explore what global skills GS are. Then we're going to consider the evolution of global skills. And there are so, so many frameworks and categories regarding this area of skills. UNESCO, the PISA Global Competence Framework, ATC. We're going to look at only two of the forefathers of this field and simplify it and look at four simple ways of accessing global skills. And then last but not least, section three. This is the practical bit. This is how we're going to recognize, develop and practice those global skills. I should say, I don't know your individual teaching context, of course, for all of your classes, but I hope that in there, there'll be something for everyone, whether that's an activity you can go and use in your next lesson, or it's something to think about and ponder about by yourself. So I mentioned it was going to be interactive. So before we begin properly, may I ask you your first question? How do you feel about teaching global skills? I've got five options there for you to choose from. Number five is your own option. Please write in whatever you want. But you might be number one. So I'm not 100% sure what global skills are. You might be number two. Global skills, life skills, 21st century skills. It's confusing. You might be three. I want to teach global skills, but it's difficult to include everything. What number? We've got lots of ones, lots of twos at the moment. Um, number four, I regularly teach global skills and I've got loads of ideas. What are your thoughts? I'll give you a few seconds to type that into the chat box. So a good mix. Twos, ones, threes, no fours at the moment. No fives, love it. Okay, so a good mix of one, two, and three. So if you have chosen one, don't worry, we'll identify what global skills are in this webinar. But at the same time, I'm confident you do know what they are and you're probably already using them. Number two, yeah, I hear you. There are a lot of names and a lot of classifications about this area of skills, but we're gonna simplify that today. Uh, number three, yep, it is impossible to do everything, isn't it? It really is. And I think teachers have more than enough to do. Look at what we've gone through over the last couple of years. So it can be challenging, of course. Number four, awesome. Uh -huh, I see someone has, I see a couple of fours have just popped in. Fantastic. So I've got a special invitation for those of you who have got lots of ideas. Great. Let's move on. And let's start with our first section then, when we're gonna identify and explore what global skills are. And it's time for another question for you immediately, I'm afraid. And I'd just like to ask you, can you give me an example of what you think might be a global skill? Can you pop that in the chat box for me? Cooperation, that's the first one in. That's a great one, yep. EQ, communication. Tolerance of differences, oh, that's a lovely one, Daphne, yes, great. Turn taking, oh, there's lots of them, fantastic. Cultural knowledge, digital literacies, empathy, critical thinking, creativity, managing information, <clears throat> teamwork, awareness of English as a lingua franca, yes, Eleanor, that's very close to my heart. Lingua cultural knowledge, community, fantastic. There's a huge, huge, huge mix of global skills here. And they're quite interesting. There's some that are cognitive, We've had critical thinking and critical thinking. We've had sort of social skills, interpersonal skills, interaction, uh, communication, and we've had some professional ones, communication in the workplace. 
Lovely. Let, let me show you some more examples here. So these are just a few examples. It's that big red banner says, there are many, many, many more. There are loads. This is not an exhaustive list. And I think sometimes this is the, the unpleasant thing about global schools that it feels quite unwieldy. There's so many of them. So as we know, there, from all of your examples, we know that global skills cover many different areas of your life. It can be social, it can be work, it can be learning. And that's probably one of the reasons they're quite difficult to uh, define and give a clear definition of. But what we can say is that all of these global skills, the ones on my slide, all the brilliant ones that you're writing in now, they all have shared common qualities. And this is how we'll identify what a global skill is. Let's have a look at those qualities. So seven qualities here of global skills. Complements language knowledge, dynamic, empowering, future focused, inclusive, omnipresent, transferable. So starting at the top again, complementing and extending language knowledge. Remember that language knowledge alone is not enough. We need to have that language used in the real world outside the classroom. This is why we need global skills in our teaching materials. It's so important. And in Speak Your Mind, which I'll give some examples from um, in a moment, uh, in Speak Your Mind, the global skills are already integrated in the course, overtly and covertly, which is great. Dynamic, because global skills evolve and change as the world evolve. Uh, just think of all the skills we've had to develop and use on a daily basis in the last couple of years, which five years ago, 10 years ago, we didn't need to use. Empower, yeah, the brilliant thing about global skills, they are life enhancing skills. They're there to improve everyone's lives, right? Future focused, yes, they're all focused, whether that's on the near future, so it could be using a global skill straight after the lesson, or, Future, a little bit further away, maybe moving towards a new career where English or the second language is used a lot more. Inclusive, global skills are available to absolutely everyone, any age, any nationality, any level. They are omnipresent. So I think they can be used in almost every area of life. They're probably already in your course book, in fact. Transferable, yes. The key thing with global skills, they can be used in more than one situation. And most importantly, they can be transferred beyond the classroom and into real life in a number of different environments. Let's move on to the second section. And as I mentioned to you at the beginning, we're just going to look at two forefathers of global skills. So time for another question. What can you tell me about this picture? Anything you like. Oh, great guess from Daphne, Bloom's Taxonomy, Bloom's Theory. It's a hierarchy, Marianne, exactly. Is it Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Is it steps to be learned? Got the goal on the top. Mm -hmm. Learning theories, a food pyramid, lovely. <laughs> Bloom. Okay, a girl's pyramid from the general to the specific bottom up taxonomy. Fantastic, lovely. So, in this question, you're immediately using a global skill. You're using your thinking skills and thinking creatively and critically, and maybe recalling what this pyramid is. And what it represents here is Bloom's taxonomy. We can't mention global skills without mentioning thinking skills. So, Here's Bloom, and then you will see that um, we've got Bloom's taxonomy on the left from 1956. That's the original one, which was intended to assist um, educators in setting objectives for their curriculum. And then on the right, we've got the revised version. And you'll note the different words, the different form of the words between the two pyramids. So in the revision, there's a deliberate use of the verb form, the imperative there. Make the group, group names a bit more dynamic and indicative of the cognitive processes involved in it. Also, those imperatives make really, really easy job for writing your lesson objectives. They're really helpful in that way. And as you can see, they're the same. There's just that, that change in word and a slight change in idea, but both of them, we've got that ascent in difficulty and the complexity of thinking skills. So if we start at the bottom, 
we've got there the lower order skills, remembering and understanding factor knowledge. Then we're going up to a more procedural and conceptual knowledge in the middle, applying and analyzing. And then up to the top, the higher order skills. So the metacognitive knowledge, the evaluating and the creating. And I love this, it's super, but I'm not 100% sure how practical it is to plan lessons and lesson objectives. I don't always find that transfers that easily. So let's look at another approach to thinking skills and information processing. Here's our second one we're going to look at. And here we've got Kagan's information processing approach to thinking. We've got 15 fundamental types of thinking and it's quite neat. It's already, we've got three neat columns, three groups from understanding information to manipulating information to generating information. So again, we've got that, that ascent, that progression of difficulty, of difficulty and complexity. So I think it's pretty neat. It's nice and tidy, but I'm not sure about a couple of the sub skills there. You can see that I've highlighted by a red box, um, synthesizing, evaluating, questioning, problem solving. So for me, I don't know if synthesizing and evaluating are quite similar and maybe they sit under manipulating information because I think you are manipulating and changing and accessing information. So I'm not sure about those questioning. Could that go and understand an information because we sometimes ask for clarification when we're trying to understand something new. So it's not, it's not quite perfect. It's pretty good overall though. It's, it is very helpful. It's, it's very good. One thing it is missing though, and the same with Bloom, is that interpersonal social skills, the things that you mentioned earlier in the chat box about communication, they're not really included in here. So we probably need a different classification of global skills or a broader classification. So broader, but simpler. So luckily Macmillan Education has one ready for you. And it's this very neat, set of four areas of global skills. So you can immediately see social skills, those interpersonal skills, um, they're in there. And we've got thinking skills there. So we can't not have thinking skills. We've got working skills and we've got learning skills. What I love about this also is just the four names. Thinking skills, working skills, social skills, learning skills. Simplicity is key and we know what each area covers. So let me ask you another question. Which one of these four areas applies to employment and professional skills? Great. All of them or work in school? Yeah, excellent. Great. That, yes, thank you. And that's Cynthia who said they are interrelated. Brilliant, yes. Because I think the brilliant thing about global skills, yes, if it's a skill that involves employment and professional skills, it will fall under that heading, in, under that area of working skills. But also we can see from the diagram, but all these skills overlap a bit. So a skill that we've used in the workplace could also be used in a social setting, in a learning setting. And equally, thinking skills for me underpins all these areas. Do you agree? Do you think there's a natural overlap and a very positive overlap with these areas? All parts of the process agree, yes, yes. You're welcome to disagree, absolutely agree. Yeah, I think this is a lovely way of looking at global skills and very simple, four simple areas. So we're doing it topically. Let's dive a little bit deeper now and have a closer look at these four areas and some examples of sub skills. So we've got that the diagram again with the four areas for you and now, four columns of sub-skills, one, two, three, four. Could I ask you to do another task and match one of those global skills to numbers one, two, three, and four? What do you think? And remember that there can be some overlap. One thing, and I will give you the answer in a moment. I'll just give you a chance to Type those in. Great. We've got, yeah, most of the answers are in agreement, actually. That's great. 
all are global skills, absolutely. Can we push a little bit further in which areas they are? Think and social, okay, lovely. Let me show you the answers then. And here we go. So the first column, learning skills. So that's picking up on autonomy, adaptability, digital skills, exploration, innovation, numeracy. Second column, the work skills, collaboration, communication, organization, presentations, teamwork, time management, all of those are great. Interesting though that communication, we can move into one of those other areas quite easily. Three social skills, challenging stereotypes, citizenship, cultural awareness, independence, networking and social responsibility. Last but not least, the mighty thinking skills, analysis, creativity, critical thinking, decision making, imagination and problem solving. Great. So now we've had a bit of a think about what the qualities are of a global skill and how we can identify them a bit better. And we've had a look at these four areas, thinking skills, working skills, learning skills, social skills, and the sub skills within each of those. Let's now have a look about moving them into your classroom. So discussing points, remember, and looking at classroom activities. This is the practical part, lots of ideas, hopefully. So, and if you've come to one of my webinars before, you know that I love an acronym. So I'd like to use the word transfer, very important to global skills, to look at some techniques, some ideas and some examples of global skills, starting with thinking. Thinking skills, of course, we, we can uh, we've got to include that as the first one. It's such an important big one. So we're going to look at an overt example of thinking skills and then some covert, discrete examples of thinking skill activities, which you can use in your next class very easily. So first up. Thinking skills, interpreting. This is an overt, in your face, thinking skill activity. There's no doubt about what this is about. The heading shows us the skill and the sub skill. It's there in black and white, well, red and white, interpreting. It's great. And what I love about that type of heading is the objective is nice and clear. It's great for planning your lessons. It's great for your students. They have the orientation of the lesson and it's great for writing your objectives. So we've got a graph here. You don't need to read it in detail. Please don't worry. I'll just explain that the graph here shows the percentage of female college graduates in selected subject areas. And then there's four comprehension questions below to check understanding. So we're already using the thinking skills of understanding, analyzing, assessing, in addition to the main thinking skill of interpreting. This is the great thing about global skills. There's one global skill and then two or three others are also being used. So can I ask you, after this task, this is the first one, task A, as you can see, what tasks could you follow this up with and use more thinking skills? What do you think? How would you follow this in class? An analysis. Yeah, great. Why questions? Absolutely. Why questions are brilliant for getting that critical thinking going and creative thinking. More questions, comparing, comparing to own country. That's brilliant, isn't it, for social skills, raising that intercultural awareness. Open questions about personal experience. Absolutely. Personalization is so important. Debate and cultural differences. Oh, there's so many fantastic examples here. Find the differences, true, false statements. Yeah, that's a great test of comprehension. Design a graph, setting some information, reasoning, think absolutely loads, brilliant. Yes, anything to synthesize that information is using a, a thinking skill. Also simplifying that information would be using a thinking skill as well. Are you able to use your language knowledge to simplify it and explain it to somebody else? Pair and group work discussion we've had here. You could do your own survey, create your own graph, find a similar graph, and then describe it to the class in the next lesson. There's lots of things you could do here. Let's look at some smaller thinking skills activities. So I say smaller, but uh, those should be, but little she is fierce. These are small looking activities. They're not directly labeled as thinking skills, but they offer some proper, solid, good thinking skills work. 
So we've got four simple techniques that you can use. Ask open-ended questions. Do you remember with the pyramid, the single one I showed you, and I asked, what can you tell me about it? So you could have said, there are six colors, it's a pyramid. You could say anything you wanted, small bit of information or large bit of information. You could have written a, a treaty about Bloom. It's open there for the student to think and offer whatever is going on for them. Maximizing interaction. This is a great way of just simply offering more thinking skill time for your students with a very average exercise in your class. If there's a simple pair work discussion, maybe before the pair work discussion, you give 30 seconds, one minute for individual students to have a think by themselves, maybe thinking of language they're going to use, um, maybe thinking of their ideas about the topic, whatever it is, to just think and prepare before the pair work, and then add on after the pair work, a little short class discussion to share ideas. That would be a great way of promoting thinking skills. You can also use cooperative learning, pair work and group work, projects or task-based learning would be a great way. And last but not least, finally, extending your course book exercises. So could you use prediction more? If there's a great pick, if there's a great headline, could you ask students what they think the text might be about that they're going to read? Could you flip your classroom? Could you ask students to read a longer reading text before the lesson? So then they've got time to read at their own pace, to maybe look into more information about the topic if they're interested in it, to think about it and formulate some ideas before they come to class. And fact check. Can you get your students to check information that they've read or listened to or to research it more? Things that just inspire a bit more creativity, a bit of imagination. So let's move on to our next letter. It's the letter R and a little bit of prediction. What do you think it's about? Here's a picture here to help you. Can you guess what this tip is about? Yes, Daphne straight in there again with an answer. And there's lots and lots of answers. Fantastic. So I think everybody has got it. And the answer is rehearsal is the word. So today we're looking at global skills that students can transfer from the classroom out into real life. So your classroom is the rehearsal before the real life performance. Your classroom is the safe place where students can experiment with new language, ask questions, get feedback on their successes, get feedback on the areas they still need to improve. So it's really important to keep this rehearsal stage in your lessons, to keep getting in as much opportunity to practice as possible. So when you're lesson planning, think of every way that you can provide extra practice, extra production time, anything to increase student talking time. And we've just looked at that with ways to do similar and smaller thinking skills activities. Can you include any of those in there to help to add more rehearsal and practice? And a key thing with rehearsal, of course, the final point is that you must ensure your classroom has the right atmosphere for learning, which leads me to the next letter. I think this is quite difficult to guess. It's two words, one beginning with A, one beginning with F. It's related to the emotions in the photo, but I think this is quite difficult. Can anyone guess it? I'll be very, very impressed if you can. Oh, someone has, there we are. Oh, two of you have. <laughs> Any other ideas? Or you can see the, you can see the <laughs> answers in the chat box. So effective filter, brilliant. I thought that was quite a good, quite a challenging one, but there you are, well done, <laughs> that's brilliant. So I think this is so, so important for every class, for every course, whatever it is, whatever age you're teaching, whatever level you're teaching. The effective filter hypothesis is part of Krashen's comprehensible input hypothesis, 1982. And this relates to the emotional variables that a learner has and how that impacts positively and negatively on the ability to learn or acquire language. So the effective filter hypothesis, that posits that when students are experiencing negative emotions, say anxiety about speaking or being told off, or they don't like the group they work with, 
if that's the case, if there's negativity, then the affective filter is up or high. So the input cannot get in. No learning can get in. The student has kind of protected themselves with a brick wall from anything. Conversely, when students experience positive emotions, just like with these yellow and red faces, when they're feeling happy and supported and confident, the affective filter is low or down. And so input can get in, and that's when the learning happens. So we've just said that the classroom is the safe place for rehearsal. So creating that uh, positive classroom environment is key. It's the first step to building that all important rapport, which fosters relationship and builds trust. It's essential. Let's move on to the next letter. This might be an easy one. I think this might be easy. Yes, we have an answer already. Brilliant. And this one is, of course, noticing. Lovely. And just in that task where I've asked you what that word means, what that word is, sorry. You've used a number of global skills then. So if you've, you've used recall from Bloom, that remembering the phonetic chart. Uh, you've manipulated information from Kagan's second pillar. You've applied your phonological knowledge because you know how those phonemes translate into graphemes. Or if phonology isn't your friend, then probably you've manipulated the information, you've done a bit of problem solving, a little bit of deducing and thinking and, and worked it out that the word is noticing. So global skills are everywhere. They are omnipresent, as we said at the beginning. So noticing. Are you and your students aware of the global skills in your lessons? Sometimes, yes, they're obvious, like that thinking skills interpreting example we had. Sometimes not so much, like the smaller thinking skills activities we looked at. But I think it's a great thing to make your students aware of these skills. So how can you make students more aware? Here are some examples. So I am a massive, massive fan of consciousness raising for students, as I've said. It's just that very active and deliberate behavior of self-noticing use is powerful. And also, if they, if they are uh, noticing that they're not using the language, then that's equally powerful because the absence is noted and we need to get the global skills in and practiced. So there are a number of ways that students can increase their noticing of global skills, you could ask them to create some sort of portfolio. So they could do a blog if they're into writing and they like that. They could keep a diary or they could answer a very simple questionnaire that you write for them, which will ask them about their usage. Um, they could do it through social media, creating a little WhatsApp group or something. Or they could do it by video, a type of video diary where they record and speak about the global skills that they've used. They could do it through project work. So you could do that individually or as a group. And obviously that's done outside of class. So you're actually using a global skill, the taking responsibility, creating autonomy within the self. You're using those skills whilst they're noticing using the skills. So you've got a brilliant layered effect there with it. You can have a, quite a simple can-do statement. I can demonstrate collaborative work, e.g. working on a project outside of class with others. Or you could have a sort of traffic light system, sort of progress along the way. So red if maybe the global skill is absent or it's not, not working very well at the moment. Amber when it's maybe in use, it's going quite well. And green when maybe your students feeling very confident about it and you're, you can recognise their competence. Any of these ways would be a great way to encourage your students to notice more. And I've just got an asterisk there on questionnaire. And that's to say that it's not just me thinking that consciousness raising is a great technique. In, in the research, in, the, in science, we've got two studies here where it's proven. So for these two studies, these are for uh, communication strategy use. So there are strateg um, communication strategy skills were taught to students and students had to keep a diary and answer questionnaires um, about their use. And both of these studies found significant gains in the use and the awareness of using communication strategies. So don't underestimate the power of getting your students to notice. And also the great thing about this 
is that it's a very natural and useful way for just assessing progress and competence ongoing, just that nice formative informal assessment as you progress through your lessons. So how about global skills noticing for teachers? Macro or micro audit. So these are this is uh, two techniques that you can use to very quickly evaluate your materials or your lesson plans. So many course books will have um, in their lesson outcomes, maybe in the contents page or in the teacher's book, they will probably list what the outcomes are. And it, it might go into this level of detail, it might not. For the top one then, the macro level audit, this just means having a look at a section of your lesson or a section of the course book and saying, okay, reading. So there's thinking skills at work here because students are thinking critically and creatively about the text. And actually social skills at work here because the text is about mindfulness and students are gonna try out one of those techniques for their homework. So two ticks there. You could do it for grammar as well. You could say, yep, thinking skills are involved because there's an inductive approach to grammar. So students have got to notice and work out the patterns of the grammar. And that could be work skills as well, because maybe the topic of the grammar exercise is a professional context. So you can grab global skills in many places of your materials. I think that's a lovely, easy, quick activity to do. And I'd encourage you to try that after the webinar with some of your material. Or if you want to dive a bit deeper, then there's this larger, more detailed audit, audit at the bottom of the page. And this is drilling down into individual activities. So we'll just look at the first example quickly together. So if the first activity is a pre-reading task, maybe the global skills are thinking skills and social skills. And then a sub-skill, thinking skill, maybe it's creative thinking, it's collaborative work, maybe they're working in pairs. And maybe then you also want to add a section on notes. So how can I really, really exploit this material? Well, I can maximize the interaction. Like we spoke about with the thinking skills and the smaller activities, you could have individual work, then pair work, then a short class discussion. That's giving you a lot of rehearsal time there, a lot of practice time. Uh, for social skills, the sub skill might be intercultural competence. So my note as a teacher then is to just remember inclusivity and make sure all students are speaking, which I guess is a, a social skill in itself because I want each and every one of them to feel competent enough to speak. And also in a multilingual class, you wanna share all those different all those different cultures and all that knowledge. Shall we move on to our next letter? And it's S. So this word, it's one of the four skills areas. We've looked at thinking skills, then there was learning skills, then there's work skills. So the other one was, lovely, fast typing here. I'm a dreadful typer, so I'm very impressed. So. There's a, um, a long line of the word social. That's our next one, fantastic. So here's another example then of, um, of a social skills example. And this is a, a speaking task, as you can see. And you don't get more social than introductions and greetings. This is where all relationships begin, whether social or professional. And there's a reason why greetings are always in course books. This is from Speak Your Mind's starter level. So that's A1, right at the foundation level. And as you can see, it's lower level. And don't forget, global skills are for all levels. That's one of the qualities we identified earlier. So this activity is at the end of a lesson. It follows a reading and a listening input on greetings and it follows some pronunciation work. And don't forget that we do still need language knowledge. It requires speakers for this activity to use suitable intonation for intelligibility. So their contractions are clear, their phonemes are clear and to convey that message. So if you sound disinterested or bored or grumpy or angry or whatever, the introduction is not going to go well. It's important to keep that language knowledge at work here. Let's look at another couple examples of social skills. So again, on the left, we've got a deceptively small social skill and then a, a bigger task um, on the right, managing a difficult conversation. So the one on the left, again, this is for students of a lower level. This 
be appropriate, um, particularly appropriate for ESOL students or students with literacy issues or different orthography. This is fantastic practice time to spend reading and writing and completing RD. Remember that this is the rehearsal stage for real life language use. This would be invaluable for a low level student. And the context, as we can see, it's a, it's a social one. On the right, this clearly practices a social skill. It's managing a difficult conversation. It's that, that awkward communication with others. And we've all had to manage a difficult conversation and, and know how that feels. So in the situation here, the context is work within the dialogue. So this is also a work skill. It's also possibly a learning skill because we've got some fantastic language knowledge, language input, sorry, at the bottom of that page. As a reminder, you'll have the slides up so you'll be able to see this, but we've got language that is suitable for this particular context. So asking for an explanation of the situation. Could you describe the disagreement from your point of view? What's your understanding of the situation? It could be summarizing the situation. It appears that, so it seems that, so we've got a couple of exponents already that are appropriate to this context. And also thinking about rehearsal, and that practice stage, the fact that this is already there in a super clear dialogue means that you can rehearse this as a role play. Lots, lots to be done there. Let's move on to our next letter. F, U, what could be this word? Oh, I've got one answer, one suggestion. Functions are nice idea, but too many letters, unfortunately. So lovely. I think we have, I think we have a winner. We have the right answer. Fabulous. And it is future. And we can see from the picture that the future doesn't always go in a straight line. Just like global skills, they aren't that easy to put and compartmentalize into neat sections. But those four areas will be a fantastic way to approach that. And we also know that when we identify the qualities of global skills, they're all future focused. So which global skills do your students need and want for their future? Why are they learning English? What is their motivation? What are their goals? Do you know? Can you find out? So global skills and goals are very, very, we know that goals are very, very important in learning, but for global skills as well, they can be absolutely integral. And they pick up, interestingly, on, on self-esteem and taking responsibility and autonomy for the self. So it's also practicing a social skill when you're seeking to find out what your students' goals are. This is a great way to practice social skills and foster that relationship between the two of you. So could you encourage your students to envision, envision their future self? And this just means their, their ideal L2 self which could be anything and everything, and it could change, of course, over time. So it could be just a lower order skill. So for ESOL students, that might be learning digital skills, how to log onto a computer, which button to press. It could be survival language for lower levels. It could be watching a movie in English. It could be something social like that, or it could be becoming a global entrepreneur and using English in their professional new life every day. Second point to remember, is to remember and work towards those goals, that creates a very positive motivation. And as we just looked at with noticing, using a portfolio or things like that, to keep, to raise that consciousness with students, this is a great way to keep pushing towards a goal and creating that positive motivation. Also, choice and autonomy, another great contributor to greater motivational effort. So the power of choice, fantastic. Thinking about choice, if I asked you now, which global skills do you think your students need? What would you choose to teach your students? Can I give you 30 seconds now to think of three ideas of global skills that would be relevant to your students? So I'm gonna time you now for 30 seconds.
Denise has said at the beginning of a course, I ask students to identify topics I like to cover. Fantastic. There's three great career skills, time management, organizational skills, social skills. Got a few seconds left. Intercultural awareness, communication, how to set aims, lovely. Asking appropriately, tolerance, cooperation, digital competence, absolutely. Lovely, great, fantastic ideas here. And that's really interesting. In 30 seconds, you already had a bunch of ideas of what to do. So if you gave yourself an extra two minutes in your lesson planning, how many more examples could you think of that you could offer to your class, safe in the knowledge that these are global skills you believe that they will need? Um, I've got it on the, uh, for you now, a choice board. As you can see, it's a particularly unexciting box of 20 mini boxes. So you could add those global skills ideas into these boxes. You come up with three ideas super quickly. So how about extending that into 20 ideas? Or better still, because we've just learned that choice and autonomy is motivating, could you partly complete this box and maybe leave three boxes, four, five, ten boxes blank for students to add their own suggestions in there. Or you could give them a completely blank table if you wish. Change it as you wish to do so. And the other great thing about asking your students to make this decision, to contribute to their learning, is that you're practicing global skills. Yes, there's the autonomy there, but there's also the, the decision making, the collaborating, the cooperating, the manipulating of information, there's a lot going on here. It's a great way to look for global skills whilst using global skills. Let's move on to the next word, the next letter. Begin with E, what's the end of the word? Great, there are some very fast typists today. Lightning fingers, well done. So, empower. And as you remember, when we spoke about the qualities of global skills at the beginning, empowering was one of them. So let's now look at learning skills and work skills and how global skills can empower your students for those real world environments. So we've got two examples of learning skills here. You don't need to read them in detail, so, so don't worry at all. Um, the one on the left, let's look at that first. So this is a very clear, learning skills task. It focuses on dictionary skills. That's fine for print and online because that's the, the same input. It beautifully shows that relationship actually between global skills and language. We do need both. On the right, we've got star bursting. Um, I love this technique. So whereas with brainstorming, we're generating ideas, Star bursting is asking more questions, seeking more understanding of an issue. So it's really getting into the nitty gritty. It's great for problem solving, decision making, planning a project. And as you can see, there's questions around that star in the middle. And you can immediately tell here that the thinking skills are at play as well. I know I've just said this is a learning skill, but again, remember that that sharing and that transfer between global skills. Because for star bursting, you're gonna use the thinking skills. There's critical thinking, there's creative thinking, and also there's gonna be social skills. This could be done collaboratively. So you've got some cooperative work going on, skills work, students working together to reach decisions, to come up with ideas. So it's creative thinking. Yeah, it, there's a lot going on there. Also, I think you could probably argue that star bursting could be used in a work context, there's probably a job situation where you could use it. There's lots of potential there. Let's have a look at an example, which is completely about work skills. And this, as you can see, again, you don't need to read every word, so please don't worry about that. I've put the whole page there so you can see that it's a complete lesson in itself. And this is um, a strand, a feature that runs through Speak Your Mind called Follow a Pro. And that follows a professional's a day in the life of focuses on different jobs, different industries. So as you can see, there's a text at the top, there's some comprehension questions with that, so there's some language work there. And the language again is specific and relevant for that context. There's a discussion task, so there's some collaborative work going on there. There's a video, then there's some group work, and there's more discussion. Loads of good language work, but all relevant to the job and to professional life, 
and using work skills, global skills in the background. What I do want to draw your attention to is exercise C, which is um, highlighted on, on the right there for you. And these questions are super transferable questions. So your students could use these two. What could they do with these questions? What do you think? Transfer to their own job, absolutely. They could discuss in pairs. So you've got brilliant collaborative work there again. You're working on conversation skills, good speaking skills, language knowledge, absolutely. Interpersonal skills have known each other better, exactly. So you could interview your fellow classmates. You could carry out your own research into a job you're interested in. Pros and cons of jobs, that's a great idea. Find someone who and interact within the class, that would be great. Writing homework, absolutely. A role play. And there's only five questions. So I think also we could stretch that and maybe add another five questions, possibly even more. You could make a video, you could role play. There's lots of potential here where you could bring in even more global skills. And let's now move on. We're nearly there. It's the final letter and it's a letter R and it's real life. And this is a very super simple reminder that the ultimate destination of global skills is transferring those global skills from that rehearsal stage of the classroom with that lovely affective filter keeping your students safe and out into the real life, confidently using those global skills. But the other side of the coin, as Will and I were speaking about at the beginning, um, is bringing real life into the classroom. So I'll be giving another webinar on the 22nd of February looking at that, and that's part of the Global Teachers Festival. So please do come along if you can. And I have one more task to ask you, if I may. I know you've all worked very hard, so this is optional. But if you wanted to transfer some more knowledge and use your global skills, could I maybe invite you to try one of the global skills techniques we've looked at today? Maybe it's the smaller thinking skills activity. Maybe it's doing an audit on your materials or your lesson plannings. Maybe it's telling a colleague about the webinar or an idea that you liked. Or maybe it's sharing your own ideas. And there's a Padlet there with a QR code. If you want to go there and contribute your ideas to that, that would be lovely. So let's look at what we've covered in today's webinar. So at the beginning, in the first section, we identified and explored what global skills are, and we looked at the qualities of a global skill, those seven points that they all share. Um, we've considered the evolution of global skills. So we looked at Bloom, and we looked at Kagan, and those four clear areas from Macmillan, thinking skills, learning skills, work skills, study skills. And we looked at some sub-skills of those. And We've just finished section three, discussed the points to remember and looked at classroom activities with the word transfer as our acronym. And can I test you now your ability to remember that lower order skill at the bottom of Bloom's pyramid? Can you remember transfer, what all those words, all those letters stand for in the word transfer? So T was for thinking, what was R? Rehearsal, great. A? A is a bit longer to type, isn't it, I'm afraid? But your fast fingers has coped with it. Fantastic. Affective filter. N was for? Noticing. Fabulous. S was for? Social. Two, one of the four uh, global skills. Absolutely. F was for? The future, fantastic. E was for empower, lovely. And R that I've just mentioned for real life. Wonderful. Thank you so much. That, that's brilliant. Brilliant. Excellent answers. So I will just say a very huge thank you so much to everyone for your amazing efforts and contribution, brilliant ideas and participation as always. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time and for coming along. Thank you very much, and I hope it was useful. I will stop sharing now and hand you back to Will. There we are. Lovely. Hello. Thank you so much, Hi, Hi. Rena. Hi. Hi.
Thank you so much. God, what what a roller coaster! You got so, you got so much stuff in there. That was so helpful. Thank you very much. Oh, good. I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> no, absolutely. I think I mean I, I said to you um, before we went live today, talking about the first time we did it, and it was just I really like how you you talked about what global skills are. It, it, it's not a taboo subject. It's just not hmm. a taboo question. What are global skills? It's just a I think it's quite a commonly asked thing. What, what actually are skills? What are life skills? Twenty yeah. first century skills what are they yeah, i think it was yeah. really good to start with that and make sure everyone's on the same page um and then you sort of just looked at it all so really 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 helpful thanks so much for the time that you put to, um to, to put this together oh, my my absolute pleasure as always no a genuine pleasure thank you <laughs> pleasure pleasure rona so we've got a couple of questions you got time yeah 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 go for it of course of course please do so they're actually coming in now think of fast okay so the first one I'm going to ask is, uh, how can you include uh, or use global skills to promote uh, cultural or community awareness on issues like global warming, COVID-19, etc.? Mm. I think Project Works is, is a really good thing that immediately springs to mind for me. It's thinking about autonomy and fact checking. So a lot of uh, getting online or doing some research in, in whatever way works for you, doing your research into that project. Um, yeah, explore more, getting the facts, collaborating, sharing views, and then because we're so lucky we're online and digital, getting views beyond that classroom and that local environment, seeing if you can extract other ideas and find things on social media from different countries, different cultures, as many different things as you can, a good sort of hunting, gathering mission of information and then synthesizing and looking through, through all that information would be good. Right. I think it also starts from the uh, teacher as well, doesn't it? I think the teacher needs oh, to have absolutely. certain attitudes um, as that role. I'm not yeah. saying as a person, but as, as the role yeah, yeah. that the role they have in that in that particular um, moment is to ensure that the environment is of that nature yeah. that, that lots of yeah. in, in the standpoint to a point is is acceptable. Yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think um, in many ways, I think ELT is. is it's just already beautifully positioned for global skills because we've naturally, we, we, I think we're naturally sort of interested in each other and, and different cultures. And most classes, or many classes, are multilingual anyway. And you've got to communicate in order to understand each other. So it, it's yeah. a very natural sort of breeding ground for learning more and having better understanding. So absolutely starting with the teacher and add yeah. from there. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, okay, so talking about teamwork um what can we do if there are a few teens within the group or even young adults or even older adults i suppose uh who just don't want to collaborate in the activity uh they leave all the work to the others to, to the other people in their group uh and simply say i don't like working in groups yeah that, that's can a tricky that one now, please, Rena, for, for everybody yeah. yes absolutely that's fine yeah this is this is a constant challenge you know <laughs> always it's like getting students to turn on their cameras and there's always there's always going to be some challenge to overcome with one personality I think if it's probably more appropriate with slightly younger adults I guess it might be a case of having a, a sort of grown-up conversation to say but in these lessons I need you to be contributing because this is the way that I'm assessing your language use because I can hear you speaking and using the language so I need to I need to hear that to assess your language and also if global skills are hopefully part of the curriculum, it's this is what part of the way that I get to assess it. So I cannot assess it if you don't show me it. You can be just that overt and ask about it. Um, you could be very bold and just bring it into the class as, as a discussion. Is that okay for someone to step back and for others to step up and do more work? Because sometimes culturally, you know, that may be more acceptable. In, in some ways. So it's probably just trying to have a, a good conversation about it. We can't obviously force anyone into it, but it's also pointing out all the positives that a group work, the skills then, because you won't get on with everybody, but you've got to learn to, to work through that. Um, there are a number of, it's good to collaborate and learn and listen. This is part of real life. It's, yeah. it's the rehearsal stage, isn't it? Yeah, and I suppose if they're there, then they're there to they're there with a purpose, and they're not going to reach. Them. Hopefully, as you say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Purpose, or the teacher won't recognise whether they have. If they're absolutely, involved. yeah. Um, thanks, Rona. So, um, next question. Um, hold on a 
minute. I've lost them. We have the same question three times, apparently. Oh, I can give three answers uh, if you want. So exams are in the centre of education, um, unfortunately. Semi, uh, semi. Oh, hello, semi. It's the semi. Our semi. Hello. Exams are at the centre of education, uh, unfortunately or fortunately, um, uh, <laughs> depending on your perspective. Um, how can global skills be prioritised in assessment? Mm. Prioritised over language knowledge? The or just in, yeah, the, included? The, you know, the, the language, uh, the vocab, and the grammar, um, the four skills that exams usually um, test for. Mm. Um, yeah, it's a difficult time. I was thinking uh, in terms of integrating it into assessment, then I think using like the noticing techniques, some sort of smaller ongoing formative assessment would be good. In terms of getting them into testing, listening, speaking, reading, writing, then it might be sort of using the theme of the global skill as the, as the context for the language knowledge. So yeah. whether that was an, an environmental issue to look into how to deal with waste management and there's a reading text about it. So it might be, which is a, a, a slightly unsatisfactory second view way of dealing it, but that would be a way of, of um, addressing that and putting it right at the heart of the assessment. But I think for me personally, I always feel that these, particularly with interpersonal skills and, and monitoring um, people's ability to collaborate, to communicate, to listen, those are things that, that I, I feel are probably best to be observed really as a teacher. Right, okay. Cheers, Ryan. I'd say. Um, yeah. So Bilal has asked, are there any resources that cover all global skills? Or can you recommend some resources that, um, that sort of, that, that they can use a bit of a go-to? Um, well, I've, I've got to say it's integrated in Speak Your Mind. There's the, all of them are, are through there. So, so I, in terms of uh, just going ahead with, a, with a, a language course that has got an integrated, again, covertly, an overtly integrated bunch of global skills. That would be a great way to do it. Absolutely. Well, um, I've got a link here. Oh, Funnily enough, I've got a link right here, right? <laughs> As if by magic. There we go. There's a link to um, amazing. There's a link to speak your mind there, so that covers all the global skills. Yeah. Um, and yeah, focus on confidence communication. Yeah, absolutely. And, and as we've just sort of looked at with a few bits of material and a few examples it's quite easy to um, apply global skills to different types of activity and different types of material and when you examine it oh actually there's social skills there there's a learning skill there's a work skill there's a thinking skill there's a lot we can apply as teachers to your lesson plan to the material you're using yeah thanks Rona one more if that's okay. all right yeah, one... yeah of course is that all right yeah, so yeah, of course. Stephanie has asked, because this is not the first time this is asked, so asking about starbursting, specifically when you're talking about starbursting. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, how would you use it actually on a practical level? How would you use that in, in a classroom? I think it's super for project work if you're starting off. So um, if you remember that the, the sort of shape of the, the star, uh, so in the middle, you'd have the name of the project. So if we're doing waste management again, if we're thinking again about environment and then all those little points, the star go off. So we have what, why, how, when, where, da, 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 all the WH questions. But then, of course, you can tweak it and add other little questions as well if you want. And so from there, you're going to start thinking with your project for waste management. Why is it a problem? Where is it a problem? What can we do about the problem? And start asking questions. And, and the brilliant thing is you probably need two or three questions when you start doing a starburst. And then suddenly there's six questions, eight questions, 10 questions, and they do seem to sort of multiply brilliantly. So it's great for project work. Um, I've certainly used that shape for, uh, for lexical sets. So if you wanted to revise emotions, you can have that. And then a little into positive emotions, negative emotions. You can use it for um, vocab, grammar as well. You could go through the tenses if you want to look at the present tense. You could use it as a sort of study aid um, as well. Brilliant. Thank you, Rena. Okay. Yeah, I, no think, I think we've um, mined your mind as much as we possibly can. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, think, I, think I don't mind. Great. You, you, you don't mind. There you go. Number three. <laughs> Uh, so you're doing it again at 9.30 tonight, aren't you? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, so, yes. Um, I think you see you then. Yeah, see you then. <laughs> um, so uh, we'll give you a bit of a break. I've got a few things I'd oh, like okay. to take you through. So um, you're welcome to stay. You're welcome to go. I'll, I'll leave that to you. All right, lovely. Thank you so much, Will. Thank you Perfect. again. Thank you. Um, okay, so I'm going to share my screen. I've got some wonderful things to tell you about.
One thing I wanted to let you know about is that Rona has not only just delivered this webinar, she's written a blog on this, um, it's the same subject as well. She covers various different things within the blog compared to the webinar. So it's not simply the, the information from the webinar. There's all sorts of um, helpful things in the blog as well. She also recorded it. So if you want to listen to that blog, it's there as an audio version as well. Um, so go to the website, there's a QR code there if you want to go and have, uh, take a look at that to read a bit more about what Rona has to say about global skills uh, for adult learners. So uh, go and take a look, it's all there for you. Thank you, Rona, again. Um, and another thing I need to let you know about. So a few times within this session, you would have seen Rona um, bringing up a course uh, which specifically looks at global skills for adult learners and how to develop them as con uh, confident adult users of English. It's what it's all about. So what Speak Your Mind does is uh, provide students with coping strategies designed to increase their confidence in a variety of situations uh, and includes activities that encourage learners to, to consider other points of view, as Rona was saying, think things through, as Rona was saying, and express their ideas and their solutions, as Rona was saying. So simply put, it's the idea that better thinking and processing of information leads to better speaking, which really helps equip learners with the skills that they need to thrive in their life outside of that, that environment, that classroom that, that, that you're training them in. Um, also, the video content is an example of how Speak Your Mind connects language to practice to, to real life. Speak Your Mind's got a real focus on that, making sure that there's a bridge between the classroom and actually how they're going to be integrating, uh, interacting with the world using English and using the skills that Rona has just taken you through today. So as she said, there's a follow up, there's a, a series of follow up pro videos um, that look at the lives of people working in a variety of different professions which can really speak to the student and in turn motivate and encourage them um, in, their, in their own journey of learning English. Uh, it's completely flexible to speak your mind. So if you're teaching in a uh, fully face-to-face -face environment or you're fully on online or somewhere in the middle, um, it's, it's fully flexible. So it's, it's got your back. So however you're teaching there, uh, it's completely configured to, to suit any teaching scenario. Uh, you can find out more, as you can see at the bottom, there's a little uh, website there, macmillanenglish.com slash speak hyphen your hyphen mind. Uh, so, or you can go to macmillanenglish.com and you'll, you'll find it easily enough in our online catalogue. 